Well, thank you, uh, Arlene, for that great introduction. Um, and hello, everybody, and, and thanks above all to Andy and, and Mark and John and their colleagues for this incredible scientific work they did, um, which their detective work about science um, led us to do some detective work about the regulatory system. Um, so uh, we asked, now that we, we, we particularly were commenting on the, the paper about New Jersey, um, and we asked, now that we found, or that they found these uh, polyethers in New Jersey soils, um, how did the regulatory system deal with these chemicals, which after all were new? Um, we started with a normative proposition that the regulatory system should protect public health and the environment from undue risk, should promote the development and use of safer alternatives to more toxic chemicals, and should provide sufficient information to the public to assess toxicity and to see how well the system is working. Um, so we asked, can we tell how well the regulatory system has done in response to these chemicals? Um, we looked for publicly available information. Um, we thought about searching by the chemical name or structure, but we found that very difficult to do. But thankfully, we had the CAS number uh, from the Washington et al. Science publication. Um, so that's what we searched for. And we went to look uh, in multiple sources. The logical starting point for us was EPA. Um, we started with a regulatory source, the database of chemicals that EPA maintains under the Toxic Substances Control Act as amended by the Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act, the basic chemical regulatory statute in the United States. We also went to look at the non-regulatory source, which is EPA's CompTOX database, stands for Computational Toxicology. It's a giant compendium of toxicology information about a vast number of chemicals, far more than are regulated, um, from many sources, including the published literature. Um, we went to look in Europe. We're not experts on European uh, chemical law, but we knew about REACH. So we looked at the REACH database and we went to the paper that, that the Washington paper cited by the European Food Safety Agency uh, about these chemicals. And finally, we did a literature search. Again, of course, we're not toxicologists, we're lawyers, but we did the best we could. And what did we find when we went looking? The answer is basically we found nothing. Um, the literature search, several different approaches we took turned up absolutely no published literature about the toxicology on these chemicals at all. Um, we then went and looked at the EFSA opinion, the European Food Safety Agency. Um, that paper concluded that subject to certain restrictions on the manufacturing technique and residues, nonstick cookware coating made with these polyethers present, quote, no safety concerns for the consumer. Um, and the opinion cited three papers, uh, but did not pr provide any details about those papers. So we submitted a document request under Europe's public access to document regulation asking for them. Um, four months later, we got copies of the studies, found out that all of them were commissioned by Salve, the manufacturer, uh, from a private laboratory. None of them has been published. Uh, the copies we received had redactions of all of the investigators' names and even the name of the chemical, which we thought was pretty funny because we knew what the chemical was. That's what, why we asked about it. Um, study number one was an Ames test which concluded that the substance, quote, does not induce reverse mutations in the tested bacteria under the reported experimental conditions. Second was an in vitro mutagenicity assay, which concluded that the substance did not induce chromosomal aberrations in the tested hamster cell lines under the reported experimental conditions. Um, third was, uh, I'm not sure if I got these in the right order. Third was a, um, Clastogenicity assay, which said that the, the as I think I mentioned the chromosomal aberrations. The third was a mutagenicity study on a mouse cell line, which reported the results in very similar terms. Very limited amount of study, very carefully couched scientific conclusions. Um, and then just this week, six months after we submitted our request, we got another document from EFSA which is a study from 2006 by a private lab, also unpublished and commissioned by Salve, 
which determined that the residual content of a chemical whose CAS number was reported but whose name was redacted um, left in the uh, parts that it was used to manufacture. Um, one interesting thing about this paper is that for the first time it actually told us for sure what these chemicals were used for, uh, which was as an emulsifying and dispersing agent during the polymerization process of the fluoropolymers, and then concluded that the residue in the finished food coatings was less than 20 micrograms per kilogram. It seems that that was really important to EFSA's conclusion that there was no reason for safety concern. Um, EFSA is still processing our request. We'll see what they give us. We then went to the European REACH database and could not find a REACH registration for these compounds. Um, we did find a CLP labeling requirement for these compounds that identified several hazards, which on their own are pretty scary sounding. Acute toxicity, chronic liver toxicity, ecological toxicity. Um, we haven't submitted yet a document request to ECA. Um, we haven't been able to find without one we haven't been able to find any of, the, any of the science on which these hazard assessments are based. In CompTOX, the EPA computational toxicology database, we found the chemicals listed and literally no information about the toxicity at all. No information saying it's toxic, no information saying it's not toxic, just nothing. So finally, we went to the regulatory database, the EPA TOSCA database. And we found that these chemicals are not listed in the publicly available TOSCA database. Um, of course, that means there's no information about them that's available. A member of the public might very well conclude that these chemicals are not regulated at all under TOSCA, or maybe even that they don't exist. Um, we know they exist, but we can't tell whether or not they're regulated under TOSCA. And the conclusion is that we ended up at a brick wall when we tried to find out what regulators knew. And Wendy will talk about why that wall was there. Wendy, you're muted. I'm so sorry. I spend uh, half my life on Zoom, so you think I'd know better than that. Um, so as Steve mentioned, um, as lawyers, we were very curious, why can we not learn anything about this particular chemical? What is going on? Um, and so I'm going to talk about some of the impediments we encountered as lawyers in trying to learn more about them. <clears throat> and if you had a subtitle for my end of the talk, it's uh, the three greatest hits in regulatory dysfunction of chemical regulation. Um, so I'm gonna talk about three in turn. The first in, I'm focusing on US federal regulation, not on EU, although we're happy to talk about that in Q&A to some extent. Anyway, the first dysfunction essentially responds to the question, how could we know nothing essentially about the toxicity in public databases of this chemical? And the answer in terms of how we do regulation in the US is that rather than put the burden on the manufacturer to assess the risks of their chemicals, that burden is placed almost exclusively on EPA, including starting just with a literature search of the toxicity of the chemical. And this is for over 40,000 chemicals in commerce. So EPA has this enormous burden of assessing the toxicity, figuring out the economic costs and benefits of each of these 40,000 chemicals. And you might ask, well, what about the manufacturers? Presumably they have greater expertise to do this um, assessment. And the manufacturer's role in US regulation is a responsive or a reactive one. Um, they can essentially bird dog what the EPA is doing. They have the right to legally challenge, for example, if EBA orders them to do a specific test on their chemical. Um, and they have succeeded in, in sometimes challenging those testing orders. Um, they also have the ability and do successfully challenge EPA's risk assessments and its own um, understanding of the toxicity of those chemicals. Um, so for example, if EPA says that asbestos has risks that outweigh the benefits of that chemical, 
um, the manufacturers have been successful actually in blocking EPA's regulation. So no wonder with this dysfunction number one that we know so little about chemicals in the United States when the burden is on EPA. And no wonder actually EPA has managed to ban only five chemicals legally in over 40 years of our chemical regulatory program. All right, so that's uh, regulatory dysfunction greatest hits number one. Greatest hits number two, well, at least we said as lawyers, even if we understood we wouldn't learn about the toxicity, at least we should find this chemical in EPA's TSCA database. But it was nowhere to be seen, as Steve mentioned. So we still don't know why this chemical didn't appear in any of EPA's databases, um, but I'll offer some of our hypotheses. Our leading hypothesis, our hypothesis, and I think Mark uh, gestured towards this, was that this particular chemical that Washington et al. found is trade secret protected, meaning that the, the um, company is allowed to keep it a secret because they gain competitive advantage. It's sort of an alternative to patent. Um, now, if this happens, and if a chemical is trade secret protected, under EPA's program, it drops completely out of sight. Um, we don't even know it exists. And um, I think as Mark mentioned also, even EPA scientists, unless they're cleared to see this confidential information, don't even know of its existence, uh, much less what it is. Um, but you might ask, well, actually the chemical structure it turned out for this chemical was already in the literature, published the structure itself. So how could that be trade secret protected? And the answer is that EPA historically deferred to manufacturers. If they said it was trade secret, it was automatically trade secret. It was put in confidential files until some external event essentially prodded EPA to figure out whether that claim was actually justified. Um, and so Steve and I together did a freedom of information request because that's the kind of thing that can help trigger whether um, this chemical is, trade, is actually justified as trade secret. We expected EPA to respond that it was and go away and there's nothing you can do about it. But instead, we were shocked. Um, about two months later, we got a response from EPA that they didn't know about the chemical either. They had absolutely no record of it by cast number name or molecular structure. So we have filed a second Freedom of Information request, thanks to a, a lot of experts that helped us um, to draft a broader one that includes some other cast numbers. Maybe this chemical is embedded in a salt, giving them alternative molecular structures. But one thing it told us as lawyers is just how incredibly slippery this identification of chemicals is, even that so much so that you need um, chemists to help you draft a freedom of information request. So we'll keep you posted on what we find. A second reason maybe this isn't in the uh, database of EPA is that EPA actually provides exceptions where chemicals don't have to be logged in. And some of these are self-executing, meaning manufacturers say, oh, I meet the exceptions, so I'm not gonna report the chemical, but it's impossible for anyone to know whether they're doing this. There's no paperwork. Um, so it's possible, for example, Salve said, I'm entitled to the long chain polymer exception. Um, we have no idea if that's the case. And the only party that could probably find out is EPA if they sent them an inquiry letter. One minute. So there's other, there's other hypotheses as well. Um, obviously, maybe Salve is in violation of federal law. Um, and we list some other possibilities in the paper. All right, so dysfunction greatest hits number one. Toxicity is rarely gonna be discovered except by EPA. Dysfunction number two, lots of chemicals manufactured in the US are not gonna be on our public databases and not available to the public. Dysfunction number three, I'm sorry to say, I think is uh, the worst, although I think you're the most familiar with this one maybe, and that is the treatment regulatorily speaking of substitutes. So surely you would think with common sense that if this kind of a chemical might be a substitute for C8, surely it would get a higher level of scrutiny. Um, the answer is no. In the US regulatory process, a chemical enters the system like any other chemical. We have equal treatment of chemicals. Um, and so we start this process again, like a Groundhog's Day movie, where um, it's up to EPA to do a literature search, it's up to EPA to do the testing, it's up to, up to EPA to do some assessments, and the manufacturers can challenge it at every turn. So no wonder um, that when we do find super hazardous chemicals and we pull them out, rarely, 
uh, we see dozens, hundreds, thousands of progeny essentially replace them, starting the same horrible cycle over again. Um, now, Steve and I are lawyers, so all we do is bad news stuff. That's what we love. That's why we're lawyers. And so I you know, think probably our discovery work is about as grim, maybe not quite as grim as Washington et al's uh, discussions. But I want to get a little bit grimmer just to hit home the point that the story that we've told and actually Washington et al have told as well, I think, isn't just a PFAS story. It's a story about chemicals in the United States. And every chemical in the United States is going to fall into this trap, um, unfortunately. So I wanted to end on one very quick happy note. Um, unlike most of you who are scientists and are bound by observations and empirical research, as lawyers, we all sort of make things up. Um, but that also means that law is much more dynamic, it's much more flexible, and it can not be the way it is. So even though I've described a highly dysfunctional regulatory system, and we all appreciate the political problems of changing it, by no means does it absolutely have to be this way, and we can only look to Europe for some ideas. Um, so the question that Steve and I are most eager to hear your views on is how do we build a better mousetrap for chemicals like this? Uh, ideally, putting aside the political issues, actually what would a, a great regulatory system look like? So thanks.